we should probably do some sort of introduction. Be like, hi everybody, I'm Patricia. Hi, I'm Woogie. <laughs> <laughs> and we're weird as fuck. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose you probably should, I guess so. Yeah. Because someday we might be famous. <laughs> 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 okay, so. Mm-hmm. 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 There's a place high in the Himalayas where human remains are scattered like sand on the beach. No, we're not talking about the Rainbow Valley on Mount Everest. We're talking about Rubkin Lake the mysterious pond where hundreds of travelers have met their untimely end, and no one knows exactly why or even who they were. Are you ready for another story? Yes, I'm ready. This one I don't have any idea on. The other one I actually heard about, we talked about beforehand, so... I am totally oblivious on this one. Cool. Nothing sexier than an oblivious man. (laughs) (laughs) So this one takes place in the Himalayas in India. And it's kind of a weird story, which is obviously why it caught my attention. So back in the 1940s, a park ranger was wandering. Well, not wandering. He was patrolling the area. And he came upon bodies, like a lot of bodies. And initially he was concerned that they were Japanese forces that were trying to sneak into the country over the Himalayas. And he reported it to the British because at the time the British was still in charge of India through the East India Company. And because all the people were dead, they weren't that concerned about it at the moment. But when they finally did send somebody in in the 1950s to take a better look they realized that some of the bodies that they found were over a thousand years old. That's weird. And there were a lot of them. By some estimates, there were 800 bodies in this tiny lake at the top of the mountains. All dead. All with similar injuries. And no one was entirely certain why. So what's the injuries? Massive blunt force trauma. So all of them were killed, more than likely. Well, yes and no. So in the 1950s, the authorities were able to go in and take a look and take samples and take closer inspection. And what they found was that most of the bodies that they f- that they located, I would say a good portion of them, had massive blunt force trauma injuries to the head and upper back and shoulders. They'd been bludgeoned. But by who? So they just walk them up there, beat the crap out of them, and toss them in the lake. See, that was a thought. But they left them there with their jewelry, their clothes, their weapons. There were lo- there was lots of evidence that all of their valuables had been left behind. And you would think that if somebody was up there executing people or even performing ritual sacrifice that they wouldn't just bludgeon the people and leave them out in the elements to rot. Especially weapons and stuff. They would totally grab that stuff. One would think so. I mean, if somebody was going up to be ritually sacrificed, you wouldn't give them a weapon. No. May the odds be ever in your favor. You know, I, uh, Honestly, I think with most people, if they had a weapon, they would fight back. So on a warm summer day in 2005, a team from National Geographic set out to figure out exactly what was going on. They made the trip of the mountains, and they retrieved 30 skeletons. Some of them even still had soft tissue attached. That's how well-preserved they were. Mm, yummy. <laughs> well, it helps them to determine a lot, actually, about the people that are up there. Not just their gender, but they can date the people. They can determine where they came from because they can do DNA testing. And they can get an idea of what region that they're coming from to help them determine what they might have been doing up on top of the Himalayas. And what they found were that a lot of the skeletons dated from about the 19th century. So not that long ago, the 1800s. But there were some that were as old as the 9th century. So like I said, about a thousand years. 
And in fact, researchers found that there were three distinct groups that came in waves. So was this some kind of major crossing that everybody used to like cross into somewhere else all the time with? Well, and that's what researchers thought, that maybe that this was, you know, a major trade route. But after further research, they thought, mm, no, not really. What they do say is that the first and oldest group consists of people from South Asia. So India is South Asia. So people from the local area. And they made the trek up to the lake in about the ninth century and died in a single cataclysmic event. And that fit with local legends that told about a group of pilgrims, including, and forgive me, I'm probably going to butcher this poor man's name, the king of Kanush, Raja Jastaval, and his pregnant wife, Rani Balampa. They were making their way up to attend the Nanda Devi Raj, a festival that was dedicated to the goddess Nanda and occurs every 12 years as a shrine to her up in these mountains. I hope that it's a her. I may have that wrong. No, it's a goddess. Okay. No, I'm just an idiot. Okay. So they were up there um, attending a festival dedicated to this goddess. And the songs and the legends that have carried forward from this period talk about this troop coming, going up the mountain to this temple. And they did something that angered the goddess. And rather than receiving them and their gifts, the goddess lashed out. The king and his worshippers weren't devout enough. And they don't go into a lot of detail to say what that means to be less than devout. But what they do say is that the goddess, in her anger, struck them all down. And what, that, what they think that means is that they were caught up not necessarily in the anger of the goddess, but in a massive ice storm. That's weird. Yeah. But how would that get blunt forth trauma to their heads and their backs? I guess humongous hail or something. So imagine this group. They estimate them to be about 850 people strong. Up on this mountain in the Himalayas, there's not a lot of shelter. There's not a lot of cover. And there's a sudden freak ice storm. And you've seen the videos from Texas and Arkansas where they have these huge hail storms. They've got hail that's the size of tennis balls. You've seen what that does to buildings and vehicles. Now imagine being a person out in the middle of nowhere with no cover, no way to escape, and that comes raining down from the sky. It would definitely beat the shit out of you. It's going to seem like it's the wrath of the gods, and it's going to kill you. 850 people died on that mountain in that one event. And while it's not a super common thing to happen... They think that it's happened often enough to leave Rubicon Lake full of bodies. I wonder if there's like a gorge through there that makes the, if they're going to have freak horrible weather and it happens right in that particular spot, like us with the gorge, right, all with the, the horrible River weather gorge. goes right through there. Mm -hmm. So that would be a main spot where somebody's going to get killed from nasty weather with us or the, of course, we have tons of volcanoes and everything else that can kill us, but it doesn't seem <laughs> to happen much often. <laughs> Thank God, right? Yeah. Well, I'll have these pictures up on the website, but if you look at my screen right now, you can see what Rubicon Lake looks like. And this is in um, the early spring. And see how it's just this bowl? It almost looks like it's the top yeah. of a, a crater. Pretty much if you fell from anywhere, you would land in the lake. Exactly. Almost. And if you're up on the upper portions, you're going to be completely exposed. Yeah, there's absolutely no trees, nothing but just rock, water, no caves. And snow. There's, no, there's no way to get away. So look at the next picture, and you can see that there are so many bones. I mean, there's clothing here, and there's just piles of bones. There are so many people that have met their ends here. You can literally just see their bodies sprinkled everywhere. So because of these songs and legends, um, scientists were able to sort of trace it back to that one cataclysmic event. And they've said that the injuries that they see are consistent with somebody being caught out in a massive hailstorm 
where you have these large chunks of ice that are falling from the sky. Yeah, well, if that's 800 people, that would be a lot of skeletons, just that one event alone. Just that one truth. And if people are going up there all the time every year, it definitely could happen. So that explains the first group, the ones that have been there for about a 1,000 years, 850 people, basically bludgeoned to death from the sky. The more recent dead are a bit harder to explain. DNA sequencing of the more recent bodies found that they belonged to travelers from Asia, Greece, and the Middle East, people who would have no reason to be up there because, like I said, this wasn't a trade route. Crossing the Himalayas is not for the faint of heart. It's not something that you do just for shits and giggles. You don't do it unless you have a real reason to, to do it. And be an experienced climber because that's a long ways to go. Exactly. And this is a Hindu temple. So this is not something that people from Greece and the Middle East would necessarily be interested in going and paying homage at. Well, there's people that are just curious that want to travel and like to climb, might go there just so they can see something at the end of their hike. Right, but how curious would you have to be to climb the Himalayas just to see that? I'm not curious enough to climb up on any tall-ass mountain myself. I mean, I really want to <laughs> see Petra, but I'm not sure how motivated I am. And it's 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 down closer to sea level. I wouldn't have to climb a mountain that would require me to have specialized equipment or probably be hardier than I am. Let's be perfectly honest. I'd probably be dead halfway up the mountain. Well, I'm, when I'm hunting and I get three, 4,000 feet, man, it's hard to breathe. It is, and this is significantly higher than that. So that's what scientists are still trying to figure out. Were these traders that were trying to find a way into India? Because we know that... Trade with India was really lucrative. It still is. They are a repository for gems, for spices, for silks, for garments, even exotic animals that couldn't be found in the West. It seems like it's got to be some kind of crossing that people took or something, but except it's really horrible and nasty weather and shit. It is. And like I said, climbing up there isn't for the fate of heart. So that's what... That's what scientists are trying to figure out. It's also possible, like you said, that people were just adventurous and they wanted to travel and they were curious. Um, it's a lot of people to get curious, but especially in waves, because remember, they said that it was over the course of three main waves that had come in there. So you would have to imagine that this isn't just a couple of guys who decide they want to see what's up there or they're going to climb the mountain just because it's there as Edmund Hillary was famous for saying, there had to be a purpose. There had to be a reason why you would drag groups of people up the Himalayas. And as of now, they're not entirely sure what that is. But what they do know is that climbing up by Rupkin Lake is incredibly dangerous. And if you're going to go, you need to bring a very sturdy shelter. Or you could find yourself at the bottom of the lake with everyone else. Sounds like fun. <laughs> Sounds like something that I would really actively like to avoid. Yeah. I tend to stay away from places like that. But there's a lot of stupid people out there that will say, hey, let's go try that. <laughs> and we never hear from them again. I'm more of a man than you. I'm going to go up. I will survive. And then they don't. Yep. Then they add to the bone collection. And Darwin laughs. So that's the story of Skeleton Lake. And I would pronounce the uh, province in India that it is in for you, but I can't. So I'm not going to uh, humiliate myself. I'm just going to tell you it's in the Himalayas. And it's weird as fuck. The story is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that's the story of Rupkin Lake in the Himalayas, also known as Skeleton Lake for obvious reasons. So every region, every nation, every continent in the world has their own legends of strange, mysterious creatures that no one has seen in millennia. 
We have our Sasquatch. Mexico has the Chupacabra. The South has the Gator Man. I thought ours was Bigfoot. Same thing. Sasquatch is the Native American name for Bigfoot. Bigfoot's cooler. Going squatching. But few are as universally recognized as the Yeti. You ever wondered why? No, probably because more people saw them or something. Well, no. But there is a reason why the Yeti is seen in popular cinema, books, music, paintings, all manner of artistry. And it all has to to do with one man and a photograph. This is a story of Eric Shipton and the Yeti. Stories of the Yeti date back centuries among the people of the Himalayas, predating even the Buddhist monks who had come to take up residence there. It's said that the Lepka people of the region worshipped a glacier being as a god of the hunt, and that the Bon religion venerated a wild man whose blood they used in religious ceremonies. So one would assume they had seen it in order to harvest the blood. You would think so. You would think so. But, aside from their legends, they had no proof. According to those legends that they passed down, the Mi... I'm going to mispronounce that. The Mirgod was a large, hairy, ape-like creature that lived high up in the mountains and could be heard howling into the night. One of the early, re- earliest recorded sightings of the Himalayan wild man by a Westerner was made by B.H. Hodgkins in 1832. He was a trekker in the mountain with local Sherpas when they spotted a large, hairy, bipedal creature covered in long, dark hair that ran from the group when they saw them, retreating into the mountains. Their tracking did no good. They couldn't find him after that. They determined that it was likely an orangutan, although the great apes are not known for inhabiting the cold alpine regions of the upper Himalaya. There's no way it would survive out there. Well, probably not for long. Um, I don't know the entirety of the orangutan's diet, but I do know that it's not rocks and snow. There's not a lot to eat at that elevation. Mmm, moss. Also, although they're hairy, it's not the thick kind of fur that an orangutan would need to survive at that elevation particularly not in the brutal, brutal Himalayan winters. Yeah, they're not that hairy. No, they're really not. Or tall. Well, they're pretty decent sized. Not the height that everybody says that the Yeti is and the Bigfoots are seven, eight, nine feet tall. And Well, Yeti and Sasquatch are different creatures. Um, the Sasquatch is reported to be well over six feet tall, closer to seven, seven and a half feet tall. The Himalayan wild man is closer to about five and a half feet tall. So just a bit taller than me. So it's not entirely impossible that an orangutan could be mistaken for something like that. But it really lacks the necessary natural adaptations to survive in the Himalayas. Yeah, that's for sure. Other reports of the creature came in through the 19th century and increased going into the 20th century as more and more Westerners made their way up onto the Himalayan mountains trying to look for a path to the top of Mount Everest. They wanted to get to the top because they want to be macho. There you go. It's all about testosterone. It's all about sticking your flag on the top of the hill mountain (laughs) it's a big hill (laughs) well most of the stories are brief glimpses and footprints in the snow there's one tale that stands above the rest and is responsible for the wild popularity that the yetis enjoyed from the 20th and into the 21st century eric shipton who was an experienced and well-respected mountaineer 
took a photo that would become the most famous bit of Yeti evidence in the world. In 1951, as Shipton and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay searched for a route to the top of Everest, they made their way across the Menlung Glacier. To their amazement, they came across a path tromped into the snow, a series of well-defined footprints going in a straight line up the mountain. Because the snow was fresh and it was incredibly cold, the top layer of the snow was frozen, so these footprints were really well-defined. Shipton looked along the path, found the most well-defined of the batch, and laid down his ice axe and took a picture so that he could have a comparison of the two. Would they photograph the print using that axe as a as a measuring point, for lack of a yeah, better word. Measuring tool. I forgot what the word was that I'm looking for. <laughs> measuring you, tape. No. <laughs> no, what's the word? For a measure. Well, for, for comparison. Yeah. Comparison, they, that's it. We'll just call it a comparison tool. Whatever. They determined... That, <laughs> sorry about that. They determined that the footprint was about 13 inches in length, which was... Pretty decent sized, although not remarkably so. Well, if it's five something tall, that's a pretty big foot. I'm about five and a half feet tall, and my feet measure about 11 and a half inches. So, and my feet aren't appreciably large. They're not small, but they're not huge. Yeah. Don't look at me like that. My feet aren't big. <laughs> 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 and it was nearly four. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Woof. And it was nearly four inches across. So a pretty decent sized foot. They thought that they had found the wild man of the mountains, the Yeti. They were, were obviously very excited. They determined that they would go after this creature. The footprints were fresh. They knew that it had been less than 24 hours since the creature had been through. And they thought that maybe, just maybe, they could catch up to it. So they followed the path. You know, like you're always saying that you should do when you see weird things. Oh, well, whenever you see fresh prints in the snow, you know how long it's been there. So. Yeah, not long. And they determined this because the sun was, in was shining and it would have melted the snow even at those cold temperatures in that upper elevation. And there was no deformation of the footprints. So they determined 24 hours, they went after it. They trekked in the m for a little over a mile to a large crevasse, which the creature had leapt across, leaving deep impressions in the snow on the other side. It was clear to them that the creature was fairly large and heavy and capable of jumping full out and landing on its feet. Now, I haven't seen too many apes try to jump. I've seen gorillas do it. And typically when they do, they land hands first. Their or hands are... All four, they can land sometimes. But yeah. But when you see them swinging through the trees and when you see gorillas charging on the ground, they lead with their hands. And this wasn't evident with the, the prints that they saw on the other side of the crevasse. So the idea that it was an orangutan seems pretty nonsensical, we shall say full of bullshit <laughs> okay <laughs> okay so it was a remarkable find but they had a more important mission to complete and they weren't confident that they themselves could leap across the crevice and come out in one piece so they decided to turn back go back to their base camp and continue on their journey remember they were there because they were trying to find a way up to the top of mount everest yeah but this seems way cooler it does seem way cooler. I'd be going after the monster. You'd be way more famous doing that than you would be getting to the top of the mountain. You could be, but they had no way across the crevasse. And saying that we had a more important mission is way cooler than saying, you know what, we pushed out and we had to run for it. That's probably more of the word. But that's not what we say. <laughs> So they didn't find any further evidence of the creature. And when they got back, although they didn't find the path to the top of the mountain, they did find enough information to publish a book, or Shipton did at least. He'd write about it in a book that he published in 1951 called The Mount Everest Reconnaissance Expedition, 1951. 
And, of course, the skeptics came out. They decided that it was probably an orangutan or a langur monkey, which are common to the region and could have easily left the prince. But Shipton disagreed. Now, he never actually said that it was a yeti. The words never came out of his mouth. But he was pretty free with saying that's not what it is, denying some of the claims. One of the claims was langur monkey. And he determined that though they're common to the region, their feet are much, much smaller and they live at lower elevations. There's little food to be found where they were, remember? Like we said, there's not, not enough to feed an orangutan, certainly not enough to feed a langur either. What's more, the Sherpa that was traveling with Shipton shared stories of having seen a very large, hairy, bipedal creature at very close range, and he was certain that it wasn't a monkey. He called it the Yeti. He was about 75 feet away from the creature when it turned and looked at him, so he was able to see it full on, and being a native to the region, he's comfortable with sightings of great apes, of monkeys, of anything that's native up there, he'd see them all the time. And he said that this was definitely not one of those. Give him a camera. Well, this is the 1950s. Not everybody had a camera on their hip. Yeah, but they should give him one. Well, I think so. I mean, leave some cameras behind with the Sherpas that live there and see what they find, right? Yeah, because they're up there and down there all the time. Shipton also pointed out that the Nepalese people and the Chinese that lived in the region were very comfortable with the animals that lived there. And even with that, they still had long-standing legends of the hairy wild man that roamed in the wilderness. And you'd think that people who live on the land would be familiar with the difference between a hairy guy and a monkey. Yeah, there's a big difference between the two. Yeah, and not just the tail. But hey, you got to make up excuses, so, you know. Sure, why not? It always goes. Well, because if you've never seen something before, you're looking for a logical explanation, right? I mean... Yeah, just like the UFOs, you know. They always got to make up some excuse what it is and what it's not and everything else. So. Well, that's because I'm firmly convinced that 99% of the things that we're shown as being paranormal or supernatural or otherworldly are bunk. You can explain them pretty easily. It's that 1% that I go looking for. And Shipton really thought he'd found something that fit that 1%. Now, scientists at the Natural History Museum thought that the prints looked like they belonged to a bear. And they decided to prove it. So, I don't know where they got a Himalayan bear. (laughs) But apparently they had one in London and they pulled it out and they took it to a sand pit so that they could capture its prints and show Shipton once and for all, this is what it is. Unfortunately for them, the prints didn't match. (laughs) So this giant Himalayan bear and these smaller Langer monkeys were not the reason for those footprints that he found. So... Because of all of this, because of this unexplained footprint, because of all of the hype and the hoopla around Shipton making this incredible discovery, regardless of whether or not they could prove anything more than we have a footprint in the snow and, you know, maybe it's a different kind of bear. Maybe it's a person walking barefoot at 19,000 feet along the Himalayas. I don't know. Maybe it could happen. It began a 70-year obsession with Westerners and the Yeti, or Abominable Snowman, as we like to call them. We've made movies, we've made cartoons, we've made... There's been an incredible amount of media surrounding the Yeti. And so the interest was greatest, of course, in the 1950s because... I don't know, maybe it was because of the specter of the war that we had just come back from. Maybe it was the looming war in Korea, but people really needed that escape. So expeditions were launched by individual teams and wealthy investors to discover the truth behind the myths. People were obsessed with finding the answer to what this hairy thing was in the Himalayas. They wanted to prove once and for all that this cryptoid did exist 
or that Shipton was out of his mind and it was just a bear. One of the most famous was American oilman Tom Slick, and I will never get tired of his name associated with oil. He funded several expeditions, including one that remained in the field for more than six months, and that's a long time to be on Everest. Yeah, you'd think they'd find something by then. If there is something to be found. He was, he was convinced that there was, though. He employed the sensitive noses of trained bloodhounds, who he hoped would be able to track something. But I think bloodhounds need to have a scent to go off yeah, of. Yeah, they got to have a scent to start with, or they don't know what they're looking for. So, yeah, exactly. I'm it's not sure how he sense. thought that would help, but he took bloodhounds up Everest, which I'm sure was not great for the dogs. Even the folks from the World Book Encyclopedia got in on the action. They reached out to Sir Edmund Hillary, who was, by the way, the first guy to actually make it up Everest while Shipton was out hunting yetis. He was a one-time believer in the existence of the creature, but he declined to help because he chose instead to focus on how to learning how the Sherpas were able to survive at such high elevations but it's really thought that he didn't want to get embroiled in the search for a cryptid because of the things that were being said about Shipton. He took a lot of grief. Even though he never explicitly said that these footprints belonged to a Yeti, he never denied the possibility. And it kind of made him something of a laughingstock. And Hillary, being a very proper English gentleman, wanted to avoid that sort of thing. So he instead focused on the science, which has actually been very beneficial for humans, but that's another story. This left the amateurs wildly speculating over what the footprints belonged to and what the hairy wild man might actually be. And as we know, when people speculate, they create. And some of these people created stories for, in popular culture. Like I said, the abominable sm snowman who shows up in Monsters Incorporated and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. They just came out with an animated story called Abominable. I'm pretty sure Laika actually put out something like that as well. But there were other films, including The Snow Creature, Frostbite, The Missing Link, Smallfoot, Yoko, Deadly Descent, and there's even a couple of Japanese love movies, love stories. Awesome. About the Yeti, which we have to watch. I love you, Yeti. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> you big hairy beast, you. <laughs> yeah, that's enough of that now. <laughs> so there are dozens of movies out there. But to this day, no one has ever been able to prove one way or the other for certain what Shipton's footprints were and whether or not something like the Yeti ever even existed. Now, there are a couple of different camps of thought here. One is a modern scientist who's been looking for 10 years. And in the process, and I'll get his name, his information will be on our, our blog site because I've forgotten it. It's just totally escaped me. Um, but he's been studying for 10 years. And in the process, he's developed science that helps to preserve these natives, native habitats of some of the langur monkeys and the other creatures that are up in the Himalayas. There are valleys that are like Madagascar and the Galapagos that are unique biomes that exist nowhere else on Earth. And he's been working to preserve that. Um, in the process, however, he believes that he's discovered what Shipton found was actually something called a tree bear. When they're juveniles, these small bears live in the trees, as opposed to living on the ground, as bears normally do. And when they're in the trees, they train their um, one of their fingers, for lack of a better word, to act as an opposable thumb so they can better grip the trees, which I'd never heard of before. I thought that was kind of cool. He believes that the footprints that Shipton found could have been from an immature bear, that still hadn't trained its foot to go back to normal, so it still had that semi-opposable thumb. Yeah, no, that sounds pretty far-fetched to me. I think it's an interesting theory, and he provides some pretty good evidence for it. Um, 
others are other scientists and anthropologists lean for lean toward something more akin to ancestral memory. So the hairy wild man and the Yeti no longer exist. But they did at some point in our distant past. And our ancestors, familiar with those stories, passed them down. Think of it sort of like a herd of elephants. The matriarch will get them to a watering hole, even if she's never been there in her lifetime. Ancestral memory guides you, even if you're not entirely clear on what it is that's moving you forward. So stories of the Yeti and the Sasquatch could be something akin to that. So something that we're aware of and that we're familiar with on a subconscious level, but we're not entirely sure why. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think there's a Bigfoot out there myself. You know, I've, I've never seen any evidence for it, and I've always wanted to. I've talked to plenty of people who believe that they are, and lots of people, your coworker, yeah, some of my relatives who swear that that's what they saw. I in had her. a whole group together mm -hmm. hunting that saw a Bigfoot and heard it and freaked out, and they left. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a wise move to me. <laughs> They should have went hunting. But anyway, it's thanks to Eric Shipton and that one famous photograph that the entire world is familiar with the Yeti, one of the only cryptids that is famous in every corner of the planet. And that's the story of the Himalayan little hairy wild man. A little weird as fuck. <laughs> Want to stay connected between shows? Find us on Instagram at Weird as FCK Podcast, on Facebook at Weird as FCK Podcast, on Twitter at Weird as Fuck Pod One, they're a little bit more open minded, or on the web at www.weirdasfck.com. There you can check out our blog, get more information on each episode, pick up some merch, send us ideas for future shows, or share your own weird experiences. You might even make it on a future episode. We would love to hear from you. Until then, tune in and keep it weird. Are you entertained? Step on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Your five-star rating helps to boost us up in the listings so other podcast listeners can find the show.